Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. And so it's nice to see everyone and happy that you took some time out of your lunch. So I appreciate you taking your time to do this. And I'm just gonna add to a little bit about what Sean said, how I got into design thinking or why I think about design thinking it really came out because I work on a lot of different projects and I do business analysis type work. And I, when you do those kinds of work, you are creating things and you're thinking about things and you're working with people. And I came across design thinking quite a few years ago and it's like, this is what I do in my everyday work. So it was making that kind of connection that really brought design thinking home to me as, is there something in this practice that I can take forward in my work so that I can do better at the things that I do. So really, you're taking your lunch hour. And so I want to make sure you are able to get something out of today. These are just the two learning outcomes that I've got is for you to take away uh, an understanding of what design thinking is, so what it can do for you and, and what it's not, because it sounds great, design thinking, they just sound so cool. And then also, as part of what we cover off today is just recognizing that you probably already have this mindset for design thinking, kind of alluding to what, what Sean said, where he's learned some about design thinking and how he can bring that into his work and into his personal life. So question for you, just to start with, if you take a look at those two uh, learning outcomes, which one is more important to you? So just as a thinking point. So as I go through with all these slides, we have a chance to kind of to go back and to tie back what I'm talking about with what I'm presenting today. So design thinking before I get to it, I just have to talk about work in general and the things that we do. Change is ongoing. I think that you hear, you know, you've probably heard that expression that change is the only constant that we have. And within our work, there's change. We recognize change. So things happen. We hire someone new and they have a different skill set. And it's like, hey, guess what? We could do this. Or there's this cool technology, there's artificial intelligence. Maybe we could do that at our work. And we have this ongoing constant of what about this or what about this? And as, a, as work, you know, we're trying to make our lives more efficient and more effective. We have this current state and we want to move to a presumably better state. And how do we get there? And sometimes it's reactive, sometimes it's not. It, it comes down to what what ways are going to be most helpful so that you can keep up with everything that's going on. And, and again, this can apply in personal. I'm talking more to kind of from a, a work perspective as well. So that change work, ongoing dynamic. And so how do you change? So if you look at an organization, you know, we've got different ways that organizations will change. Some just kind of go with it. So that's the ad hoc approach. I don't know, maybe we should do it this way or let's do it that way. And then others have a methodology. So if you work in an organization that, that builds things, maybe you're working in a fabrication shop, and maybe they follow ISO 9000. And so for design and for build and for maintenance, there's a whole structure. There's, you must follow this. This is how you document this. So you change, but you change within a particular given framework. And some consulting companies are like this too. So they've got... You know, whether we're doing our examination for discovery, here's what our notes should look like, here's the, the roles that we need to talk to. So it's a very structured approach to thinking about change and introducing change. Most organizations have some sort of planning process. And so maybe it's an operational process. It's a 90 day rolling cycle. It's a rolling wave. This is what we're going to do on an annual basis. Maybe they do some visioning. Organizations that have sort of that longer lead time, they could be looking out 10 or 15 years. Or what are we doing? What's our strategic plan look like? And so again, you're taking sort of, you can layer methodologies on top of planning processes. And of course, there's always the ad hoc stuff that's swinging around. And then within all of that, there's that structured approach of how do I do this? I have a project. I have a start and I have an end and I have a unique product service as a result that I have to deliver. So there's a project management world that's within that. And you can look from a change management perspective, you can look from a business analysis perspective too. So different ways to approach from a process perspective, how do we get from where we are right now to where we think that we need to be? 
And that thinking piece then becomes a critical element of, but where are we going? So you want to ask yourself that question. And the thinking piece, again, just at the bottom, there's a couple of, you know, we talk about systems thinking, which is probably familiar to some of you, sort of that broader sense of we're all connected, things are connected. And, you know, we have unintended consequences. We talk about critical thinking, so being creative. Um, we talk about lateral, just off from the side, different kind of brainstorming. We can take the Sherlock Holmes approach, sort of deductive reasoning. Well, and then that takes us into design thinking. So what, what do I mean? Like, what's the definition of design thinking? So this particular definition is from a company called IDO. So the first IDO and the U is for university. So they've, they've gotten into a mode now, this particular company where they, you can go there and you can learn about design thinking in a much more structured fashion. And design thinking came out a little bit from truly the design world, the consulting world, the systems thinking world. And, you know, kind of going back to the late nineties and sort of the early two thousands where individuals recognized, people recognized that we're, we're fixing part of things. We're not fixing everything. Like we have this really good idea about a new piece of technology, but you know what? We missed out something that's over here. Like it doesn't fit the person's hand. And they, you know, if they want to look at it, they have to crick their head at it. Design thinking is intended to take very much a people, a human centered approach to making change happen. And what it means then is you need to talk to people, you need to observe what they're doing right now and quickly, rapidly come up with ideas that would address that particular problem that they're having. It kind of goes to that, the quote that's there from Albert Einstein, but we can't solve problems using the same kind of thinking that we used to create whatever this thing is, this current state it doesn't necessarily fix. We get blinders on, especially when it comes to thinking, just humans in general. You know, we've got lots of biases and we have mental models. Design thinking is in, intended to, to break that, to, to help people fix things that aren't working for them. So this is just another quick little stop point for you, just to think about in your work and you know, you go to work and maybe this is part of before the work or after work on your way home. Is there a challenge that you have that's like, if this could just do one thing, when I come out at the end of the day and I ride my bicycle home, I'm so hot. I wish I wouldn't be so hot. I wish I didn't have to fill up the tires on my bicycle. I wish they could magically fill up by themselves. So this is a question for you, just to think about. You don't have to put it in the chat or anything like that. If you could fix one thing in your day, so what's one thing that's not right, quite right? What would it be? So I'm asking that question just as we go through and we talk about all of this design thinking. So maybe there's some of these principles and these aspects of design thinking that you may be able to apply to that. So you can keep that kind of in context. So design thinking, talked about what it is, human-centered approach, innovation, taking us forward. It's not, it's not fixed. It's not a formula. It's, it's not about design, like graphic design and public relations. So public relations has this, well, this is from Ruth's perspective, product, these four Ps, you know, product price and, and promoting things and where you put things, your Barbies coming out. It's like, let's see hot pink everywhere. So it's not just about that. It's not that graphic design piece. It is not a prescriptive methodology. It is not going to tell you how to do something. There is a process. There are principles with it, absolutely. But it doesn't say, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. So it is a practice that you can bring into your work and, and integrate it with however you're doing your work right now. It's not about aesthetics. Again, it's not about the prettiest design that I'm using the right colors, we're using the branding and all that good kind of stuff. It is also not about making a profit. It's not always about making money. That's a key thing to take away from here because it is a human centered approach. And so in my world, when I put on my BA hat, there's often times where the CFO wants to reduce costs. I wanna reduce administrative costs and I wanna make more money, I wanna make more revenue. And I, as a customer, I'm looking at that and I'm like, 
but I don't want to spend more money and I don't want all these other things. So I've got these different conflicts. Design thinking is about looking at from that human centered perspective, the people's perspective, which is a big switch. And lastly, design thinking, it, it really isn't for everything. It isn't, it won't fix everything. It's not for every problem. There's some things, legislative changes, anti-money laundering comes in. It's like, you have to take more information from people. Taking a design thinking approach to that won't change all of that. So design thinking doesn't replace existing business practices. So those planning processes about what the visioning that we need to do, the grander scale, doesn't change all of that. So design thinking, again, lets you focus on some aspect of the work that you're doing. And it is also about thinking differently because that's really what it is. So the solutions that you create should be, and this to me is really a, a key piece, it, they're technically feasible. I can do this. It's not so wild and out of scale that it's completely impossible for me to think about this. I'm also not going to break the bank when I do this. So I mentioned it's not about making a profit, but it's also not about losing money so that your business, you're not going to be able to do the work that you need to do. Whatever those solutions are also have to be desirable, useful from that end user's perspective. Otherwise, they're not going to get used. And ultimately, that's not sustainable. So I can create something that is technically feasible and it's economically viable. And, and maybe the end users want it. And but then at the end of the day, trying to maintain it is unwieldy. So those four pieces, those four little chair legs, those are the important pieces to think about with design thinking. So it helps you create those solutions. If you Google design thinking and you, when you Google it, there's lots of schools that uh, and, and secondary, post-secondary institutions that offer training on it. They'll, some, some of them you'll hear, they'll talk about wicked problems and they'll talk about those big challenging things. Yes, it's absolutely for those types of situations where you're integrating, you've got process and people changes that you're looking at. You're looking at something where you've, you're working with people, but it doesn't always have to be big things. So these can be smaller things that you bring to home where you realize that we're just not looking at this from the student's perspective, for example. And just one example, so working with another institution, you know, they're laying out, here's what our table of contents should look like, realizing that we've repeated three things, it's very confusing from a student perspective. So we need to bring that broader perspective in. So that at the end of the day, again, you still do, you still do wanna be efficient and effective, you still want to do that, that's still what you're striving for. It's just, it's, it's not, like I say, design thinking is not this magical process and it's not just about making money. So, so what is it more to the, what is it? Well, first of all, here's a framework. I talk, I call it a framework because it's got these big chunky things that fit together collectively. And then you get to play sort of the, the ping pong pinball game inside all of this. It starts with humans at the middle. So that's you. So we'll come to that. Collaboration is absolutely key. And what this means is you are actively working with people. So you're talking to people, you're building things together. Part of this collaboration is that it's not just you and the person sitting beside you. So you are collaborating with people that have different perspectives. And, and by different perspectives, I mean points in time, um, literally like where's their view? Like some people look inside the building and some people work outside the building. So you're collaborating. In, in the very truest sense of the word. I talk about principles. And so there are principles. So that just speaking about things like diversity where absolutely you want to have that broader sense of people, those different ideas and opinions that are coming forward, that you present things that your end users are part of this discussion. So the principles kind of goes on a little bit more, but in general, it's about collaboration and it's about working together. It's about, following the process that I'm going to talk about. So being true to that, it's about creativity. And so you wanna think about what is your definition for creativity? For me, when I think about it, it's, it is imagination. Creativity is about fun. Creativity 
is about building something. So imagination with purpose is one definition that I heard from it. And I always thought I heard about it. And I always thought that that's a really cool one because it isn't just about me thinking up a neat idea, but it's me thinking up that neat idea and then trying to realize it and sharing it with someone. So the sharing doesn't always happen, but at least I've put something together and, and cobbled something together. So creativity those bad jokes that, you know, I was talking about knock knock jokes at the beginning, like those count, right? It's like you're putting two different ideas together and you're presenting someone. Creativity requires confidence, right? Because you're stepping out to do something that is different. And, and it, that creativity comes at an individual level where you're sharing it when you're collaborating with these other folks. And then just talking about um, the process piece. So there is a process associated with design thinking. And, and this probably looks similar to some of the things that you do right now. So not so radically different. The empathy, the human side, it starts there. And what that means is you are going to whoever those end users are that are affected by this topic that you're looking at, you want to you want to recycle more bottles. How can you bring more bottles in, right? Because we have so many pop cans and water bottles. Like, what can you do? So who do you need to reach? And, and what are the challenges that are being presented to them? At this point, you still, you do have that broader team that you're working with. So it's, this isn't just you working alone. Sometimes in a project management world, in that early state, the project manager is doing a lot of this alone. They build a project charter. So this is where it's different. Right from the get-go, you're working with your business users and you're working as a collective team. And then you define what it is that you're going to focus on. So because again, it, it can be successful if we're trying to drink the ocean, so to speak. So you're setting a scope of some sort. This is the problem that we want to try to, to focus on right now or the opportunity that we're looking at. And, and once you get through that defined stage, so that defined being the parameters that you're working with, is then you ideate. So this is where English is so cool. We can just come up with different words. So it, this is brainstorming. So whether that's scamper, you know, substitute, combine, adapt, modify, all that sort of thing. But you're coming up with different ideas. Here's this bottle thing is that we need to collect more bottles, Alberta recycling. It's like, why, why do we have so many bottles going in the landfill? What can we do? So you brainstorm, and this is the true brainstorming, not just, well, I guess we could pay more money. It's like, well, we, maybe we could turn them into paper airplanes or something like that. So lots of ideation. And, and then you turn that ideation. Again, you're still working with this collaborative team that you have together to build prototypes. What does this look like? What could this look like? You and kind of going back to there, there's the reality check through all of this. So you could spend as much time as you want defining and ideating, and we wouldn't get to that newer, better state. So you do still have to put time boxes on all of this. So is this a day or is this two days, whatever that is, and then prototyping. So you're building something that's tangible that your business user, your end user can see and they can get a sense of does this meet what kind of your requirements are? Does this address what the problem is? So you, again, fitting within the existing um, world that we have, work world, it's like you have workshops, people. So it's not that you're changing and doing something super dramatically different here. What is different is part of the mindset. With this prototyping, this is where we talk about you fail. You, you make things and then they break and that's okay. That's a, a, a little bit of a mind shift for people. Once you get to the prototype that you think is, I think this is kind of close, like let's try it out, then you test it. And, and so for some folks, that would be the sort of the pilot world is here's what we've developed. Let us know how it works. So you actually put it together. So this process that I'm showing you here, it, like I say, this can be absolutely for those wicked problems, those bigger things like bottles in the landfill. But maybe this is also your process for registering people. Like let's sit down and think about how do we do this type of work? How do we register their students so that they understand what they have to do and where they have to be and when they have to be? But it doesn't end there, right? So you might at any one of these stages realize that, you know what, we kind of, we're not, like maybe we've defined this not quite right. 
Um, maybe we need some more ideas. Maybe we need some different opinions and some different perspectives coming in. So that's where what's not shown on this little visual is the fact that you can absolutely cycle back at any one of these points. So I hope that looks at least a little bit familiar to you in your world. So at work, how does this actually, what are some real examples of design thinking? So this first one, I'm, I'm kind of sad to say, and I, I saw the headline, it said Van Moof goes Van Poof. So literally this week, this, this is a Van Moof is a company that manufactures electronic bicycles. And I want to say out of Denmark, they, they just went bankrupt. So they started in 20, 2009, I think they started. And, and I'm just going to tell you the story that the design thinking story first before I talk about anything else with them. They started shipping their bicycles to the United States from um, Denmark. And, and what they found is that a significant percentage, like 25% of them, give or take 30%, were damaged so badly that they'd have to resend the bicycle. So these bicycles started about $2,000. And as I mentioned, they're electric bicycles, they're heavy. And so they were like, what do we do? How are we gonna fix this? Because this is getting expensive. These are custom bikes. So it's not like they were doing tons and tons of them. And so they applied some of these design thinking concepts and and so in this example, you've got the end user, which is the person riding the bike. They don't want it to come broken, but the path the, to get to that end user, that cyclist has many touch points. And so part of the design thinking process means you would be observing all of the steps in that process and talking to the stakeholders that are part of that process, understanding what did they do? And the, the point where it was shipped that was one of the key interface points where they were finding this issue. People, even though the box said it was fragile and there's a bicycle in this box handled with care, it was not handled with care. And in their brainstorming, they said, what can we do? And if somebody realized that the box, but it doesn't quite show it here, it's about the size of a large flat screen TV. And so all they did was put a picture of a large flat screen TV on their existing cardboard box. And they put the little picture of the bicycle in there. So any thoughts on what happened there? What was the result? I'm just gonna check, see what someone said. It was handled with care. The, the incidences of damaged bicycles dropped by 80%, eight euro, 80%. So a simple little change, again, looking at it from all of those people's perspectives, how did people view the bicycle box? How did they, you know, taking care of it? It's like all of a sudden it's a flat screen TV, nothing else changed with it. So that's kind of cool. Another one is Oral-B, so electric toothbrush. So I don't know how many people have electric toothbrushes, but they work very well. And, and we should all brush our teeth more because our teeth are important to our good health. And Oral-B was looking for, well, what else can we do? How can we make people brush their teeth more? Because we need them to be healthy and we need their teeth to be strong. And, and they came up with this cool idea of, they can make your toothbrush play music. Like you could have music on your toothbrush and you could choose whatever music you want to while you're playing. And like, maybe that would make you play more. They, they went and they talked to people that brush your teeth with the toothbrush though. And, and the problem they said was, it wasn't that I don't want to brush my teeth, it's charging the toothbrush. I have trouble charging my toothbrush because the it's in the bathroom. When I go to work, I want to brush my teeth at work, but my toothbrush is out of charge. What can I do? So what Oral-B did is they looked at that, listened, listened first, I guess I should say, and looked at that. And then what they did is they made it so that this one particular toothbrush, you can plug it into a USB port and charge it. And so that was a, a successful, again, another successful result. It's not thinking, it's not thinking about I have to add another feature. I have to convince people that they need to brush their teeth longer. The pro, going to the problem and saying, so, but what is it? It's because I the charge runs out and I can't recharge it. The last one I brought up, and again, I don't have a whole bunch of thoughts about this. So skip the depot. This exists in Calgary. We have skipped the dishes. We have, I think we should have skipped the laundry, but we have skipped 
skip, 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 right? So this is Skip the Depot. And they will come to your house and pick up bottles for you. And, and so you will get some sort of a payment for it. You can choose to donate your money to a charitable organization if you want. But for people that don't have a car and they have bottle collections, there's lots of people that live in apartments. Where's the bottle depot that's near you? Are you going to, and what if you don't have a car? How do you get there? And how can we stop putting bars, bottles into the landfill? So this is an example where, hmm, is there something, a product that we can, a service, sorry, a service that we can provide to people that will provide them some support? So design thinking, it works on products, it works on services. It's not just um, something where we have to have um, bigger problems that we're, we're trying to fix. Sorry, I have to get my screen to go forward. So back to, I mentioned it's about empathy. Um, it starts in that sort of in the heart part, it starts with you. And these are six characteristics, sort of six human characteristics that are often associated when we're talking about design thinking. These are the things that, that we look at. So here's another just a stop point for you. If you look at those six items, is there one where you would rank yourself high? And so you, you know, on a scale of one to five, five is high and one is low. Is there one of these that you would say, I'm a five, I'm totally all over that? And is there one where you would say, eh, not so much, maybe a one, maybe I'm a two, have to think about it. So I'm just going to talk about them. Ambiguity is number one. So that's just it. Um, to, to live sort of in this design thinking world. Number one is there's lots of ambiguity. Remember I was talking that earlier slide, it's about change, it's work, change, work. It's like, it's nothing stops, nothing stays the same. So ambiguity, the gray zone, the liminal spaces, you don't, you won't know everything when you go in using a design thinking mindset. And part of this is it's okay. It's okay, because it's not just your brain that's working here. You've got these other folks that are working with you and collectively, you can build that, that bigger, better solution. Curious is about asking questions. And, and this is one where like, we think people are smarter if they ask questions. Research has shown that. And you build relationships with people when you ask questions. It shows that, that you're interested in them. And of course, I mean, it's like some people ask questions and you know that they don't, they're not really interested. But from a design thinking perspective, you start asking questions. What about this? What about that? How does that work? Oh, that's really interesting. I don't get how that works. So being curious and building up that, that for me, honestly, I'm really good at ambiguity and, and curious is I consciously have to stop and ask questions. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I had a plumber to my house the other day. I should have asked questions a lot sooner than I did. Um, somebody had their hand up. Um, constructive and optimistic. Yeah, so they can totally be, be equal. Creative is when you explore things. I was mentioning earlier, so creativity is one of the underpinnings of design thinking, but it's also you're willing to try stuff out. I was reading that at the Edmonton exhibition at K-Days, there's an ice cream place and they're going to serve macaroni and cheese flavored ice cream. And it's like, really? Okay. Will I try it? Maybe that's weird. Like I don't think of those things together. So kind of going back to that creativity, you have to have a certain amount of courage to be creative. You put these ideas together, you try stuff. And, and that helps you and you fail when it comes to the constructive part. It's like that really didn't work so well, but constructive means you are willing to try to build stuff. You build card houses or whatever, but you, you can do that. You're okay with putting things together and trying them out and showing them to people as you go. Diversity, I mentioned earlier as well. You absolutely seek different perspectives. You are not looking for everybody's opinion and everybody should be like me. We're gonna talk to everybody in the department. I've heard that so many times, like, I don't care. I want you to go talk to people in the elevator. Just go talk to random people. It's amazing what different kinds of perspectives. It's like, I never thought about that. 
And then the last one is about being optimistic. So not so much that you're a Pollyanna and that everything is beautiful and everything is awesome. It's more about your, you have a practical nature to you and you can still see the upside. You can see the advantages of if we do this, still recognizing that to get there is going to pose some challenges to you, but you can overcome all of that. So that's kind of the, the human side, the design mindset piece, where it's like what you have this in you already, it's about bringing it forward and then encouraging it in the in the folks that you work with. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Yes, I agree, Mavis. So diversity is, so I didn't mention that, but thank you for bringing that up. You know, when I talk about design thinking, it sounds great. This takes time though. And that's one thing I did not mention. So to, to, to have that sense of empathy, to define the problem, yes, generally we mostly do that, just putting together a project, but then that IDA and that prototyping stages, we often don't do a lot of that. So that's where this takes a little bit, I won't even say a little bit because I can't quantify, it takes more time. It absolutely takes more time. And then to have this prototype that you're then going to present to someone to have them test it. And you may, you know, be prepared that you might have to go back to the beginning. Absolutely, it, it takes more time. And so how, how do you build this up so that you've got more of it and that the people that you're working with have more of it? So these are just six points in the game. This is something, I mean, go ahead and add to it. Um, for ambiguity, this is one where plan just enough. Um, is, do you need to be 80%? And, and again, think of this balancing and reinforcing loops of a change within our work world all the time, constant. And if I was to plan even to 80%, that's too far. There's too many changes that might get introduced. I'm more on my operational day-to-day -day work than I'm on a five-year five plan almost. Um, so go for that 70% understanding, or maybe it's a 60% understanding. Maybe it's not even that. I mean, you know your world best, and and some organizations are going through so much change right now. Uh, and maybe maybe you just agree that this is how much information that we need to know, and then we're just going to go for it, go with it. Get used to asking questions. So practice it. As I mentioned, that's not my thing is I have to do this more. Um, and, and time is a good question to always ask people. What happens next? How long does it take? That's always a good question. Um, asking how, asking why can be annoying. Like, why are you doing that? It's kind of like you put me on the defensive. But the questions, you know, tell me more about that. Just asking questions. It helps you understand. And this is design thinking really when it comes into it. It's about problem exploration. It's not necessarily about a resolution because you might find something that's, hey, this is way cool if we do it this way. Something that helps you be creative, that helps you um, work on your head. Uh, in, and this is, again, write a haiku, write a poem every day, um, doing kakuru or whatever type of, of games that, that could make sense to you. You know, if it's needlepoint, if it's doodling or drawing, it can be anything like that. Um, just doing things, trying things, trying things, planting seeds in your garden, see if it grows, water it. Um, that's the constructive part. Again, it's another one where just try it, just do it. And, and what's the greatest harm that can happen. Of course, there's a certain moral point in there. Um, talking to your coworkers, this is the diversity thing. And I think this is one where it's so one of those we've, we lost through COVID, the time when you could see someone in the hallway and just stop in and talk to them and there's something on the ground or you see a dog outside and you get distracted. Talk to your coworkers. You can at least find that different diversity of habits that different habits that people have that can ultimately may help you build these stronger solutions. They've got input to it. And, and once you've engaged someone else, they've provided input into what that solution is. They are vested in it. They'll be part of it. And then um, just the last one is about the optimism is, again, this is a more conscious, sometimes you just have to look at the opposite. Um, 
<laughs> um, sorry, I was just sort of smiling at Simon's comments about sell mercenary minded managers. Totally, I wish we could. Um, even though mosquitoes, they bite us, there's like, I don't know how many kind in my backyard right now. It seems like there's six different kinds that are trying to bite me, but I have so many birds in my backyard. It's nuts. So can you find the, the upside of whatever it is that you're doing? And part of that, again, it's taking a conscious effort to do these kinds of activities to help build your design thinking mindset. It's kind of like you wish you had a little, little checklist for all of it. Anyways, I think that's my talk. I think that's all I got. Um, yes, so that is my really quick intro into design thinking mindset and design thinking what it is and is not. And final stop point for you. Um, is there one thing, one aha moment from today that you'd like to take away? And is there something maybe, you know, can you think about how would you work design thinking into your day.